the history of the Bhagavad Gita. Now, it's a contradictory thing. Bhagavad Gita do not have a history. The teachings of the Bhagavad Gita is beyond history. The teachings of the Tirukkural is beyond history. The te teaching of the Upanishad is beyond history. The teachings of the Bible is beyond history. Then what is that history you are talking? I'll give one simple example that is make, make the point very clear. Who discovered law of gravitation? Newton. Newton. When did he discover it? 1700 or 1600, whatever it is that. Was the gravity bef exist before Newton? Yes. yes. So Gita was documented 5000 years back or 3000 years back or 1200 years back, whatever is that time. But the content of the Gita, which is about your life, which is about how you can relate with the higher order of reality, how you can relate with nature, that rules were there time and memorial. It happened to be documented at that point of time. So please, when I'm going to talk about the history of the Gita, I'm talking about the structure of the Gita and the verses of the Gita, not about the content of the Gita. Is that clear? Yes. Because otherwise I'm contradicting myself. So before Newton, the gravity existed. And even if we forget about gravity tomorrow, still the gravity will be there. Like that Gita was there before Krishna spoke. And even if the whole humanity forgets about the message of the Gita, the Gita will be there. So that's point number one. So now, if you take Gita in the current sense, which is the, the Gita with 700 verses, what Krishna spoke to Arjuna, about the specific verses we are talking, there is a history. And this Gita is part of the largest epic of the world. In the world, there are, means I would say the four, there are four major epics. Can anybody enumerate? Ramayana, Ramayana Mahabharata, Iliad, Odyssey. So these are the popular epics of the world. And Gita is part of the largest epic of the world, Mahabharata. Mahabharata, can you imagine the size of Mahabharata? 100,000 verses, 100,000 verses, approximately 100,000 verses, Iliad and Odyssey put together times 5 is Mahabharata. This is the magnitude of Mahabharata. So, Gita is part of one chapter of Mahabharata. Mahabharata has how many chapters? Everybody knows? 18. Mahabharata has a specific thing called 18. Everything is 18. So there are 18 chapters in Mahabharata and one of the chapter is called Pishma Parva. Pishma Parva means chapter on Pishma. Gita is part of that Pishma Parva. And how many chapters are there for Gita? 18. Incidentally 18. How many verses? 700 verses in 18 chapters. And this teaching of the Gita which is embedded in Mahabharata who spoke to whom? Lord Krishna spoke these teachings to Arjuna. What is the speciality of Lord Krishna here? He is considered as universal teacher or Jagat Guru. What does that mean? You may have heard nowadays anybody and everybody calls themselves as Jagat Guru. That's a different matter, but that is a definition. What is who is Jagat Guru? The one who knows everything about everything. <laughs> That's one interpretation. But Mahaparada gives beautifully interpreted, right? If the teaching is applicable to all the people in the universe at all the time. Suppose I Krishna had given a teaching that I should be worshipped only as Krishna. Otherwise you are going to heaven, hell. If you call me as Shiva, that's not acceptable. Then the, is that universal? then that teachings will be limited to Krishna's devotee. So whether you accept Krishna or not, whether you accept him as a God, incarnation of God or not, what he spoke is applicable to all the human beings. Whether you follow a religion or religion B or you are an agnostic, this is applicable to all the human beings. And 
I will show you with the example. I told you, right? The, the definition of happiness in 2018 given by the positive psychology and the definition of happiness given by Krishna at that point of time. It is exactly the same. You, you won't give any difference in the words. So Krishna's teaching is universal. And that is why he is known as Jagat Guru. And his teachings are applicable at all places, at all the time, to all the people. This is very important. Because he is not teaching sectarianism. He is not, he's, he's not saying that, I am the exclusive teacher. Everybody else is wrong. How can you say that? Nobody can say that. In Bhagavad Gita, never ever you will see such statements. That's why he is a universal teacher. And then, this teaching was compiled and put into Mahabharata by a great sage. And what is that sage's name? Yes. Yes. Veda Vyasa. What is the literal meaning of the name Veda Vyasa? Knowledge. Vyasa means compiler. Veda means the Vedas. So, yeah, of course, Veda is knowledge, but here literally means he got the name. It is not his original name. It is not his given name. It is a name he, he got because of his action. Up until the time of Vyasa, the whole Veda was not properly organized. It was just here and there. So Vyasa, what he did was, one of his greatest contribution was, he compiled the whole Vedas into four main groups, Rik, Ejus, Sama and Atharva. And then what he did was, he enhanced that teaching by supplementing more information. Like he, he is the author of the epic Mahabharata and he is the author of the 18 Puranas and 18 Upapuranas. So, and there is nothing in the world that is not connected by Vyasa. We will see that later when we do the Dhyana Shloka. They say Vyasu Chishtam Jagat Sarvam. Every literature is there is nothing in the, the world literature which can be compared to Mahabharata. We are not claiming it exclusively, but we are just showing a fact. So Vyasa compiled this teaching and put that into Mahabharata. Now the next point is, what is the, the history? Like how old is this Mahabharata? I don't want to do any false claim. There is no scientific evidence which tells me that Mahabharata was written uh, 5000 years back. 2000 years back but a rough order of magnitude estimate it is assumed that it is between 2000 and 6000 years back it doesn't matter to me right whether the truth was spoken 1000 years back or 5000 years back or yesterday it doesn't matter as long as it is truth and it is applicable to me so my approach is like that okay so you may claim you may see claims that this was 25,000 years back, 15,000 years back. Yeah, it could be true. I don't know. But there is no evidence for that. And we have to be honest. So, now. Now the problem is, Vyasa has compiled the 700 verses into this 100,000 verses of Mahabharata. What is the problem? This was not accessible to anybody. How in the world I can go and dig this 700 verses out of this 100,000 verses? So this Gita was not accessible to the common man at all. Oh, first of all, you need to know Sanskrit to read Mahabharata. Second, even if you know Sanskrit, how many people you can expect that are going to read these 100,000 verses in their lifetime? So as a result, the Gita was sunk in that huge epic of Mahabharata. So it was the great master from Kerala, Shankaracharya. He, the greatest contribution he did was, he pulled the 700 verses out of Mahabharata and presented it as an independent work. So the Gita started becoming popular only after Shankaracharya. So even though this was 5000 years back or 3000 years back, Shankaracharya, which is in the 700, means AD 700, that time frame, he pulled this out and he wrote a brilliant commentary on Gita. It is known as Gita Bhashya. And even now, Shankara was known for his clarity and his logical arguments. He, used, he was extremely logical and he was really, really, his arguments were wonderful. And 
I always used to say, now I can appreciate Gita because in light of the modern physics. Because imagine somebody is telling that everything is coming from a common source at the time of even Newton's time. Because at, even at the time of Newton, everything else was different. The classical physics. So now, in the light of modern science, we can say that this is true. Without positive psychology supporting, how many of us would have believed that the happiness is within us? So he told all those things at that time. So that is the greatness of Shankaracharya. And even now, even in my own slides, we use this extremely a lot, Shankara's commentary. So Shankara is an amazing teacher we all should be proud of. And you know how many years Shankaracharya lived? This is history, okay? By the way, this is history and there is evidence for that. 33 years. He passed away at the age of 32, in fact. And you know, at what age he wrote this commentary of Gita? 17. But 17, imagine, your teen's age. At the age of 17 he wrote this commentary, which will take a lifetime for us to study. So that's why you'll see, when we go to the verses, we'll see the logical arguments. So at the age of 32 he passed away. At the age of 17 he wrote this commentary. At the age of nine, he wrote a brilliant commentary on Vishnu Sahasramama. It's a genius. So, the Mahabharata was written down, right? 100,000 <laughs> verses. They were not orally translated. Like the Vedas were oral. The Mahabharata was written down. Correct. Okay. It was not orally trans trans transmitted, right. but over a period of time. That's why they composed as uh, poetry, right? right? So, that way you can learn and uh, pass it through. Even the script was developed much later. The Devanagari script was developed much later. So, anybody interested in the research of Mahabharata, I can talk to you offline. Sure. Uh, they try to reconcile the whole Mahabharata. One in Kumbhakonam in Madras, Chennai, mm. and one in Mumbai, Pune, and one in Calcutta. So, they try to reconcile a lot, and they were able to uh, come up with some common <laughs> verses, because it came through multiple channels. Now, let's continue. So, after Shankara, so many people started interested in Gita, naturally, because they found that, oh, this is much, much, much amazing work than compared to Upanishads, because Upanishads were complicated, and also the context of the Gita was wonderful, the message was wonderful. So, so many Acharyas started studying about Gita. So, so many commentaries started coming in. But, if I say that, you will understand. Most of these commentaries, if you read, they are contradictory. So, Acharya X wrote a commentary. Acharya Y wrote a commentary. Sometimes if you read those two, apparent contradiction is there. Naturally. It's like two people, two blind people seeing elephant. So, and again the beauty of the Gita is that it lends itself for multiple interpretations. If I'm only interested in my health perspective, yes, there is a lot of content in the Gita. If I'm only interested in the mind management, I'm not interested in God or anything like that, still there is a lot of content in the Gita. If I'm only interested in Bhakti, devotion of God, yes, there are contents in the Gita. If I'm interested in emotional intelligence, there is... So each teacher, depending upon his background and tradition, he tried to interpret Gita in one way or the other. I cannot say that one commentary is better than the other or one teacher is better than the other. Every commentary has its own merit. But when you look at these commentaries, sometimes you may feel that they are contradictory. No, it is not contradictory because it just shows the magnitude and the humongous size of the Gita. That, that's all it is. So that's what I was telling you even last week. When you go and now when you listen to Gita talks and if you go and retake three, four books, you will be confused initially. So just get into that rhythm. Once you get that basic message, go and read the commentaries. It makes sense. Okay. So each commentary has its own merit and it brings one aspect of the Gita. Now I just listed a few commentaries. The first one is Ramanujacharya, again from Tamil Nadu. Ramanujacharya wrote a commentary on the in the 10th century and the beauty of this commentary is, it is from the perspective of Vishishta Advaitam. 
it's a school we are going to talk about that little bit later on a high level it says that i am part of the whole if god is the whole i am part of the whole that is the vishishta advaita advaita is what i am that god and dvaita is what i am different from god these are the three points of view in our literatures in our uh, indian spiritual tradition every um, acharya follows one tradition so rama shankara's commentary was pure advaita he says that i am i am god ramana acharya's interpretation was what i am part of the whole and madhava acharya who is a dvaita philosophist his interpretation was what i am different from god now you may ask me which one is correct everything is correct it's all a point of view i'll give one simple example imagine a huge ocean and some waves in that ocean so can i say that the wave is separate from the ocean it's a point of view every wave exists in that ocean it grows in that ocean finally it merges back into that ocean and with respect to that wave that ocean is a god it's a point of view i can also say that that wave is also a part of the ocean because if i add all the wave still they are part of the ocean so that is the vishishta advaita view now i can say that what exactly is the essence of this wave and essence of the ocean what if, what is the the constituent part of the wave water what are what is the essence of ocean water. water so from that perspective wave equal means i am the essence of the wave is the essence of the water means ocean so that is the advaita point of view so it is point of view don't say that advaita is wrong or vishishta advaita is wrong or advaita is wrong and unfortunately in our country advaitas fight with vishishta advaita people and advaita people fight with advaita people without knowing that these are only point of view and you have to appreciate all that's all so that is madhava acharya's commentary which is from a dualistic perspective and then we have the third commentary is abhinava gupta abhinava gupta it's a brilliant commentary have you heard of kashmiri shaivism it's another popular philosophy in india kashmiri shaivism and this abhinava gupta acharya's commentary was closely follows the kashmiri shaivism tradition it's very interesting right so how these cultures connects in kashmir there was lot of shaivism on the other side tamil nadu has a lot of shaivism so kashmiri shaivism it follows and it is a beautiful commentary and in the third i mean around 11th century this commentary came and this commentary tells that the battle of kurukshetra is a battle within brilliant commentary so that is abhinava gupta the next one is sridhara swam it is in the 14th century very simple commentary sridhar swami is again follows advaita plus devotion he was a big devotee plus he had the advaita point of view he wrote a brilliant commentary on bhagavatam and this 14th century commentary was from him and then there is vallabhacharya most of you might have heard of vallabhacharya he is a bhakti vaishnavite person he wrote a commentary of gita so now if you take vallabhacharya's commentary and shankara's commentary apparently it will be just opposite but keep in mind that it's two point of view that's all then the next one is madhusudana saraswati madhusudana saraswati 16th century again it is based on advaita this commentary is known as beautiful name gudartha deepika gudha artha deepika that which brings out the hidden meaning of the gita it is advaita point of view then there were two more commentaries sanskrit commentaries popular commentaries one is called vishwanatha chakravarti 17th century a bengali he was from the vaishnava tradition and finally baladeva vidyabhushana again uh, vaishnava tradition 18th century these are the popular sanskrit commentaries how many of you, how many of these commentaries you have heard so far shankara of course right ramanuja madhava okay. Madhusudana Saraswati also somebody might have heard because that's a popular commentary. So these are the popular Sanskrit commentaries. 
Again, this is history, so we can move. And now, this commentaries. Again, I'm talking about a brief history of the Gita. By the way, I co copied this name from one of the most inspiring book I have ever read. A Brief History of Time. Mm -hmm. Have you read that book? Yes. It's a simple book which talks about the concepts of physics to a common man. If you haven't read, go and read that book. It's a beautiful book. So, A Brief History of the Gita is copied from that name. Now, coming back. So, we are talking about this um, uh, Sanskrit commentaries. How many people know Sanskrit? How many people here know Sanskrit? That itself answers. <laughs> so what is the point in writing commentaries after commentaries after commentaries in Sanskrit? Only a few Sanskrit scholars enjoyed these things. That was changed by a great master from Maharashtra. <coughs> Yaneshu. So Nyaneshwar, he popularized the Gita. He translated the Gita into Marathi. And the whole story is beautiful. You might be knowing more than me. So uh, his father, Navurti Datta Maharaj, uh, taught him the Gita. And inspiring from that teaching, he sat on the bank of the river Godavari and he used to read each verse in Sanskrit and translate that into Marathi. So many people got inspired by his teaching. And there was a scribe. He had a scribe. His name is Sachidananda. He wrote this and published as Jnaneshwari. It's a wonderful work. And Jnaneshwara and Jnaneshwari has to be credited for popularizing Gita into other language. And then what happened? Commentaries after commentaries started coming in all the native languages like Tamil, Malayalam, Hindi, English, sorry, Hindi, uh, Urdu. Uh, who, who translated Gita into Urdu and Persian? Uh, this one, Aurobhya Brother. Aurobhya Right. He, he translated that. Unfortunately, he was killed, but he translated that into even Persian. So this is... Uh, but that whole step was started by Sant Nyaneshwar. At what age he passed away? Can you imagine? 21. At the age of 21, he passed away. Remember, <laughs> we are sitting here 30s and 40s and 50s, right? He, at the age of 21, he uh, brilliantly did his work. And even now, I am sitting here and thinking about him. Think about all of us. We do a lot of things for our family, children. We do X, Y, Z. Imagine our grandfathers also might have done the same thing. Our grandfathers, grandfathers also might have done the same thing. They, they might have worked all their life, collecting all their savings for their children. Here I'm sitting, three generations after. If you ask me my grandfather's grandfather's name, I don't even know their name. Imagine, this is exactly what is going to happen to all of us. This is the fact. But imagine people like um, Nyaneshur, he may not have done anything for his family. But even now, in North Brunswick, years after, hundreds of years, hundreds of years after, centuries after centuries, we are sitting here and remembering him with a lot of reverence. This is what makes the difference. So now these were the Sanskrit and uh, English, sorry, Indian language translation. So now let's just understand a little bit about the English translation of the Gita also. So when now Gita is available in English in how many books? It is one of the most translated scriptures of the world. It is one of the most commented books of the Veda. Means the most translated book is Bible, but most commented scripture of the world is Bhagavad Gita. It is attracted almost every type of people like Einstein, like uh, Schrodinger, uh, like uh, Oppenheimer, uh, so many people. But when did this translation started? Till 17th century, nobody outside India had heard of Bhagavad Gita, such a she. Nobody outside India have heard of Bhagavad Gita till 17th century. The first translation of the Bhagavad Gita in English was done in 1785. 
by a scholar or a person called Charles Wilkins. Have you heard of that name? You all should be remembering his name. Charles Wilkins. Charles Wilkins was an employee of British East India Company. He came to India and uh, he got inspired with the Indian literature. He went to Varanasi and studied Sanskrit and he wanted to do something. And apparently, of course, an employee can be always be inspiring. But if the employer is not supporting him or if you're not getting some inspiration, that work will not kick off. Surprisingly, the governor general of Bengal at that point of time was also equally fascinated with this book, Gita. His name was Warren Hastings. Have you heard of that name? You might have studied his name in history. Yes. And he was the first governor general of British India. He was the first one of Bengal. Later that Bengal expanded to the whole India. And Warren Hastings supported this and he paid the fund. He, means, uh, he wanted Charles Wilkins to do this translation. And as an introduction of that book, that is Charles Wilkins. And the first, sorry, first one is Charles Wilkins. And the second image is Warren Hastings. And the book, the first book got translated is in the screen. And this Warren Hastings made some beautiful comment. So he said, if anybody study and leave the message of the Gita, it is he will get peace and contentment guaranteed. That is the first assertion he made. The second prediction he made is, this is the most inspiring prediction, at least for me. He said, British Empire in India will cease to exist one day for sure. We cannot continue to rule India forever. But he said, the message of the Gita will never cease to exist. It will continue to in inspire the humanity all the time. This is what he said. So this is how Gita got translated into English. Now, okay, having a translation is good. But if that is not received by people, what is the use of that translation? I can have the best book in the world. But if nobody else is reading. The reception of the Gita in England. Surprisingly, it was received really well by a lot of people. But one problem. A lot of people started reading the book. A lot of copies were sold. But people saw that as a good poetry or a good philosophy or a good literature. That's not the Gita is. Of course, Gita has all that. But the real Gita is not that. It's a life transforming no body of knowledge. But English people, they saw this as a wonderful literature. Some people talked about it as a beautiful poetry and wonderful philosophy. What is philosophy? Philio Sophia. That is the Greek word, right? The word. What is that? Sophia means what? Knowledge. So Philio Sophia means what? Love for knowledge. So the Western philosophy mainly is based on that. They sit and write and learn, but Gita is not different. Gita is not philosophy. Okay. So this is the initial problem. But eventually what is going to happen is a lot of people, a lot of intellectuals like the English Orientalist, the, the romantics of Germany, and the, in America, the transcendental movement, they started inspired by the Gita. Imagine, if you really read Charles Wilkins' uh, translation, it's a very loose translation of the Gita. Even that started inspiring people. And eventually you can see that Gita got translated into almost all the European language. And the Russian version got inspired. Means, got, means somebody got inspired by the Russian version. Leo Tolstoy. He even got inspired by that Russian translation. And then what happened? Eventually, people started looking this as a scripture. But typically, the definition of scripture at that time in England was what? Scripture means it can logic cannot be applied. So Gita got a rare status at that point of time, around 18th century. It is treated as a scripture, but intellectually acceptable also. That was the beauty at that time. 
and then by 1800 the translations becomes available all the places every means any library you go you, you should get that so new readers found a unique flavor in Gita and finally what happened it ended up in America so from England uh, Carly there is one famous philosopher was there he gave a copy of the Gita to Emerson in America have you heard of Emerson famous poet and it changed his life completely. This is Emerson. He won uh, a Charles Wilkins copy of the Gita was given to Emerson and he read that and that changed his life. You can go and read his Google it. You will see Gita is quoted left and right and he said this has changed my life. And from Emerson the whole transcendental movement started and Gita was a really really strong input for that moment and from Emerson another great person in this country got inspired by Gita his name was Thoreau David Henry David Thoreau have you heard of him otherwise go and google his writings amazing writing he said every day means I bat my intellect with the Gita the teachings of the Gita this is what he quoted and even now, like every everywhere in this country, people quote these two people, left and right, Emerson and Thoreau, because they had a huge influence in this society. So, further, so this influence was there. By 1800, as I said, like more translations came in. Exactly after 100 years of Charles Wilkins translation another beautiful translation came it is known as the song celestial have you heard of that name it is translated by sir Edwin Arnold this is a poetic translation of the Gita poetry it's in pure English poetry he translated you can go means it's freely available if anybody wants to read that it is available probably this is one of the most popular translation of the Gita sir Edwin Arnold and you know one paradox even our own Mahatma Gandhi got inspired by the Gita after reading this so that much popular was this particular translation then another influence of Gita was 1893 one young Indian monk came here and he took the whole America by surprise he was none other than Swami Vivekananda his famous Chicago addresses and following lecture series in America also helped Gita to get familiarized he had a three lecture series in California amazing lecture series about Gita so that also helped a lot by the way how old was Vivekananda when he did that world's parliament of religion Again, I'm giving these ages just to make sure that <laughs> the, the glory of these masters. And he died at 33 or 34. So. 39. At the age of 39, he passed. Yeah, at the world's parliament of religion, he was only 29. Mm -hmm. Amazing, right? Books were so famous. Uh, you can go and read the newspaper clippings at that time. So, that's Vivekananda also helped to popularize the message of the Gita. His uh, speech is also available on YouTube. Yeah. yeah, I don't know whether that is the original speech, but it is there. Yeah. It's recorded one, uh, I don't know, I'm 100% confident about the <laughs> source clarity, but the, uh, the, the message is, is there. His, the, the, the three lectures were amazing, right? So he was given only three minutes uh, initially. That too through a recommendation. Um, recommendation of a professor from Harvard whom he met accidentally in a train. So he met a professor in, of Harvard in a train and during the conversation he got so inspired by the Swami and he was asking, why did you? Why are you here? He said, I want to go to this parliament of religion and uh, I don't have an invitation. So you know what this Harvard professor's response was? Asking you a credential is like asking a credential from sun for rising in the east and he himself just gave a recommendation with that recommendation Vivekananda was given three minutes 
and when he stood up and uttered the first words sisters and brothers of america there were one and a half minutes applause so he took five minutes to finish because one and a half minutes was applause it's a matter of pride for all of us nobody knows that <laughs> okay so coming back so vivekananda also uh, played a significant role in popularizing gita in the west now the second topic is another big influence of gita is the great indian freedom struggle the indian freedom struggle is so unique compared to any other freedom struggle of the world what is it non violent and also the the strength of its leaders the freedom struggle was so unique it was a dharma yuddha right it was it was so epic and the leader's strength was amazing and there is only one book can be given credit for this that is bhagavad gita almost every leaders of our freedom for struggle was inspired by bhagavad gita right from gandhi ji to the other indian extreme subhash chandra bose so lot of these nationalists or the leaders found gita message of the gita as an inspiration to fight against british i'll give a few example but one of the thing is they saw this battle of kurukshetra as a battle between the british only thing is that they all agreed on one term that british rule needs to end india needs to be ruled by the indians but the means to accomplish there was a huge debate one set of people led by gandhi <coughs> so gita as an inspiration for their own self strength because when they were beaten by the british they drew that inspiration from the gita on the other hand people like chandrashekhar azad subhash chandra bose they see gita as a means for even an armed fight just like the same message can be interpreted by multiple people there were two different interpretation but there was no doubt that gita inspired everybody so i'll give a few example the sudeshi movement in 1905 you can go and read our history book 50000 people gathered on the street of calcutta with a copy of gita in their hand and they promised what i'm going to boycott all the british products 50000 people that was a mass movement and everybody's hand there was a copy of the gita and then what happened in after some time around 1920s british saw gita as a trouble maker so you won't believe if they search your home and if you have more than one copies of the gita they used to see that with suspicion that much was the influence that's why i just quoted that example so capitalizing on that gita press kharagpur they printed millions of gita and they distributed that free of cost to everybody and gita diaries also were distributed to inspire people to fight for their country that much was the influence 1927 that happened and finally like there were some freedom fighters a few people i must mention here one is damodar pant chapekar is a maharashtrian i believe and then um, actually madan lal digra and kudiram bose they were executed by the british but do you know what who was their last companion of their life gita they went to the gallows with the gita in their hand and without shedding any tears it's easy for you and me to just talk about that right now but imagine they loved their motherland and this was their inspiration again this is history so just highlighting a few people lokamanya balagangadhara tilak an amazing freedom fighter the first one who claimed that 
Freedom is my birthright. He started the movement. He was imprisoned in Burma, Mandela Jail. And in that jail, he wrote a brilliant commentary of Gita, known as Gita Rehasya. Imagine he don't have he didn't have anything to consult. When I'm preparing this material, I have 35 books, I have the whole worldwide work, I have hundreds of psychology books in front of me. Suppose somebody is writing Gita without anything from his memory. He wrote that on a book in a pencil in with his handwriting. It's a brilliant work. Second one is none other than Mahatma Gandhi. If you ask Gandhiji, what was the most influencing factor in your life? <coughs> Without closing his eye, eye, he will answer in a split second. There's no other book, no other philosophy, no other teaching has inspired Gandhiji like Bhagavad Gita. He himself wrote a brilliant commentary on Gita and that name is called, book is called Anasakti Yoga. It's very famous. Anybody wants it? We have the PDF portion, version of that. We we'll give that. This commentary of Gita. Third one is Arabindo Kosh. Have you heard of Arabindo Kosh? You might be uh, Yeah. He is from, <coughs> from Bondicherry. So Arabindo's last time means he was, uh, he was round the world. He is considered as a, a genius, intellectual genius. Uh, you would see like a lot of French people got inspired in his ashram even now French is it's run by French I believe a lot of people were inspired by Arabindo's teachings and one of the most inspiring book for Maharshi Arabindo was this one is Annie Besant Theosophical Society of India Adayar Chennai she was a British social worker interestingly who supports India in the fight of freedom struggle. That was the intellectual honesty of such people, right? Uh, she was a British by origin, but she supported India's freedom struggle. Just like A.O. Hume, who started the freedom movement. Yeah. So this Annie Besant also was very much interested in Gita. She also translated Gita into English. Next person, C. Rajagopalachari. Brilliant person. Again, uh, the first Governor General of India, right? Rajaji. Yeah, Rajaji. Uh, again from Chennai. He is Chennai or Tamil Nadu? Somewhere in Tamil Nadu. Rajaji also was very much inspired by Gita. He wrote a lot of essays and a book on Gita. And his songs also are famous, right? Kuralan Pramilai. Kurayan Pramilai. Last one is Vinoba Bhavi. Acharya Vinoba Bhavi was a disciple of Gandhiji, an ardent follower of Bhagavad Gita. Now, so we are coming to the 20th century. Remember, we started from Mahabharata and systematically we moved into uh, 20th century now. 20th century, lot of masters played a great contribution in spreading the message of the Gita, starting with Paramahamsa Yogananda. How many of you, how, all of you heard of Paramahamsa Yogananda? Yes. One, quest, one thing I wanted to mention is, he is the author of the most spiritual classic of the world, known as Autobiography of the Yogi. What is the speciality of Autobiography of the Yogi? The most successful CEO of the world, one of the most successful CEO of the world, who is that? Steve Jobs. No doubt about it, right? What was his last gift to the humanity? People attended his final rites. Everybody was given a book. Autobiography of a yogi. Yeah. <coughs> Steve Jobs, who invented, means who created iPad, had only one book in iPad, which he used to read four times every year, which is, again, Autobiography of a yogi. This book, Paramahamsa Yogananda's book, had that much influence. And this book, of Gita called God Talks to Arjuna is considered as one of the scholarly work. This book is very popular and it is considered as one of the most authentic uh, book of Gita. 
Next is Srila Prabhupada, ISKCON, International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So, I'm not saying that one is right or the other is wrong, I'm just presenting the facts. Okay. So, some of you may like ISKCON, some of you may not like ISKCON, that is okay. Srila Prabhupada came to this country in 1965 at the age of 69 with $10 in his hand. He came to Manhattan and he started his mission in a small scale by teaching Bhagavad Gita in Manhattan. In 11 years, he traveled the whole world 14 times and created a huge empire. And his book, Bhagavad Gita as it is, is very popular among Vaishnavites. It's a pure dualistic presentation, but nevertheless, you have to admit his success, the way he propagated. The next is Swami Chinmayananda, mm -hmm. most popular teacher of the Bhagavad Gita. Swami Chinmayananda has to be credited for bringing the message of Gita to all of us. A lot of people here, and including myself, studied Gita under Chinmayananda. So, we all are so gratitude. We have that gratitude, and uh, uh, means without Swami Chinmayananda, I'm sure I would not have studied Gita because his teaching was so logical. He was speaking to the 21st century audience, 20th century, even ahead of the time. I told you last week, one of his attitude was longer the beard, greater the suspicion. And his communication skill was fantastic. He's from Kerala. The next one is Swami Dayananda Saraswati. He's, a, he's from Tamil Nadu. He's probably the one who has that clarity on the mission of Gita. The greatest contribution of Swami Dayananda Saraswati was he taught 10 three-year courses. Eight in India, two in the United States. He has created more than 300 plus teachers who is continuing to teach Gita. His book, uh, it's a four volume book known as the Home Study Series, Gita Home Study Series. It's a scholarly work, which is in line with the traditional teaching of Shankaracharya. The next one is Swami Renganathananda. He was the 13th head of Ramakrishna Mission. He was a scholar. He traveled the world from 1942 to 1984 multiple times, 50 plus countries he traveled. He's from Kerala. Uh, he presented this message really well. Uh, his book on Gita, Universal Message of the Bhagavad Gita, is very popular. It's a nice book. Next person is Eknath Ishwaran. Eknath Ishwaran is, uh, came to America as an English teacher. And he established something called uh, Berkeley Meditation Center in California. His teachings on the Gita, is again, he contributed a lot in spreading the message of Gita. Finally, Swami Rama. Swami Rama is from the Himalayan Institute of uh, Yoga. It's here in Pennsylvania. One of the greatest thing about Swami Rama is, he's the first one who offered himself for a medical study. So he went and uh, uh, his brain was, uh, means they did MRI scan on his brain. And uh, he was able to prove that the ability of his control on his autonomic system. You can Google that. It is there in the public domain. It is there in the scientific journals. His book called Perennial Psychology of the Gita is again popular. So these are some of the popular commentaries and the 20th century masters. And there are hundreds of other masters. I'm not saying that the masters are limited to this many. In the current generation, we have Swami Sarvopriyananda in New York. Some of you know him. He's a great teacher. Uh, we have Swami Tadatmananda who lives here. He's a wonderful teacher. We have, we have uh, Swami Surupananda of Chinmaya Mission, the current head of Chinmaya Mission. He's a wonderful teacher. We have, we have Vivekji, who's a wonderful teacher, Bhagavad Gita, who is born and brought up here. There are so many people. Swami Tadatmananda, again, he's a Westerner. He born, born and brought up in Milwaukee. He got inspired by the Gita. So this is a brief history of the Gita. So what we covered so far is the teachings of the Gita is eternal. It is beyond history. You cannot put that under the historic framework. When I say history, I was only talking about what? Only the Gita's verses and the structure. That's all. Now, the Gita is part of the Mahabharata, given out by Krishna 
compiled by Vyasa, put it in the Mahabharata. And unfortunately, this teaching was sunk in the Mahabharata. And then, later point of time, what happened was, Shankaracharya wrote a commentary. After Shankaracharya, multiple Sanskrit commentaries came out. Jnaneshwara started translating that into Indian language. And then Charles Wilkins did the first English translation. And from there, it translated into multiple versions. And it came to America through Emerson and finally through Vivekananda. And in 20th century, there were multiple masters who could contribute a lot. So this is a very, 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 very brief history of the Gita. Next week, we are going to the next topic. The next topic is as a software engineer or as a management professional, as a house homemaker, as a mom, as a dad, why should I spend my time and uh, study Gita? Why don't I go and study some positive psychology? That answer has to be convincing. So we are going to see that. And then the next topic is how should I study to realize that benefits? That will cover the introduction. If you think that any other topics needs to be added, let me know. And if you have any questions, any questions, last week I said I cannot guarantee that I will be able to answer and I already uh, put the disclaimer out there. I'm not a self-realized master or anything like that. I'm just like you only. So, <laughs> but I'll try to find the right source and give you the answer. Thank you.